The vast savanna stretches far and wide, punctuated by long mountain ranges on the horizon. Here, the tall figure of a Maasai man, adorned in vibrant red robes, is herding his cattle with a wooden staff. The Maasai people are one of over a hundred tribal groups in Tanzania, with some also residing within Kenyan territory. The approximately 500,000 Maasai people still have a way of life almost identical to that of their ancestors, living in tune with the seasons and the cycles of the sun. They thrive by herding cattle, goats, sheep and other animals over grasslands. The Maasai traverse long distances in search of lush green pastures and water for their cattle. They construct temporary shelters using branches, grass and clay, forming circular enclosures with space in the center for livestock. Their lives are deeply entwined with their cattle, and the labor that goes into taking care of the cows is shared among their children. The Maasai believe that every cow in the world belongs to them. Their wealth is measured by the number of cows and children they have, leading to polygamy being a common cultural practice. Most Maasai men have two or three wives. To propose to a woman, it requires offering cattle as a form of dowry, and each wife must also have her own hut. Therefore, only the wealthy can afford to have multiple wives. A newspaper report reveals the story of a 109-year-old Maasai witch doctor with more than 30 wives. Intrigued by this information, we're journeying to meet him and his family. This is Mashuko Ole Mapi, known as Libon. In Maasai culture, a Libon is a spiritual leader or healer who holds significant influence within the community. He's sitting amidst numerous descendants. Despite being depicted as over 109 years old in the news, he doesn't seem very old, but no one actually knows his true age, as the Maasai don't count age. The Laibon tells us that he has, in fact, only 10 wives two of whom are deceased, and the remainder reported in the newspaper are his son's wives, amounting to 100 women. This likely caused confusion for the newspaper that reported the story, due to the overall size of his family. He tells us that polygamy is common for Maasai people. The reason he has many wives is to help take care of the cattle and various household chores. As time passes, the cattle multiply. When there are more cattle, more wives are needed in order to have more children who will help take care of the increasing size of the herds. The Libon insists that having 10 wives isn't chaotic or burdensome for him because he allocates his and their time efficiently. He never seems to tire of his polygamous relationship because he has a rotor system for each of his wives. He says he chose his first wife and stayed with her until she became pregnant. Then he moved on to the next wife, and so on and so on. A wife who has not been pregnant and is not busy taking care of children will also help take care of the cattle and other various household chores, including assisting other wives in caring for their children. His profession as a traditional healer has made the Libon wealthy enough to have more wives than the average Maasai man. He tells us that many people come to him for treatment. We wonder if any of his ten wives ever have conflicts or get jealous. The Libon tells us that there have been some instances, but when conflict arises, punishment often involves being beaten with a stick, so they don't do it again. In addition to not counting age, the Maasai also don't keep track of the number of children they have, believing that counting them could lead to losing them. 
despite the lack of precise record keeping, the Libon knows he has enough grandchildren to establish a school in the village. Especially important after one of them was injured in an accident while travelling to a distant school. After establishing a school, the government steps in to support it with educational materials and teachers. 70% of the students at this school are the Libon's direct descendants. We speak to several young women in the village about the common practice of having multiple wives. They view it as normal and have no objections if their future husbands want multiple wives, with one woman even stating that she's willing to accept two or three more sister wives. While many aspects of Maasai life differ from modern norms elsewhere, today many of their traditions are fading away. In some areas, Maasai cannot travel freely with their herds as they used to, as land has been developed into protected forests, wildlife conservations and modern agricultural areas. Not to mention more frequent droughts and significant climate changes. These pressures have compelled the Maasai to adapt to unfamiliar agricultural practices, with similar changes happening worldwide. As a result, the traditional way of life of the Maasai is also evolving. If you want to see more great content from all over the world, please like the video, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon. Thank you. Uganda has the 33rd largest population in Africa, with over 48 million people predominantly adhering to Christianity, both Roman Catholic and Protestant, with a minority practicing Islam. The official numbers of those still adhering to traditional beliefs are not significant. But in reality, witch doctors exert more influence over people's lives in Ugandan society. We visit Fort Portal, located about 320 kilometers from Kampala, the capital city of Uganda, due to the renowned healing abilities of Joyce Ruamaska. According to Joyce, her grandfather, who was also a witch doctor, predicted her fate, but she'd never been interested. Then, at the age of 14, she claims to have been haunted by spirits, to the point where she had to flee into the wilds to be alone for a month. She then returned and began practicing as a witch doctor. Joyce denies any involvement with evil spirits, claiming to only treat people's illnesses. She explains that she uses over 20 types of tree bark for treatment, with each disease requiring a different combination to achieve specific healing properties. The bark is finely filtered and mixed with other herbs. She says this mixture, when combined with tea, can be ingested to alleviate stomach pains. With our curiosity piqued, we decided to undergo treatment for stomach pain. Joyce treats our ailment by spitting water into dry grass and patting it under the blouse. While chatting, she removes the dry grass intermittently to reveal bits of stone and black cloth, representing the cause of the stomach pain. Her reputation spreads solely through word of mouth, eschewing the need for advertising, unlike the witch doctors who resort to radio advertisements, a practice she deems as fraudulent. When questioned about unsuccessful treatments, however, she simply laughs without offering an answer. Instead, she shows us the various bags, clothes and gifts sent by customers, or should we say patients, as tokens of appreciation. Then she leads us to her herb garden in the backyard and presents us with herbs believed to possess the power to make people fall in love. We say goodbye to her, uncertain whether our stomach pain has improved or not. 20 kilometers from the town, we visit another witch doctor named Charles Mugisa. He also inherited the profession from his grandfather, like Joyce. 
He's currently diagnosing one of his patient's illnesses by shaking a calabash to call upon the divine from an antelope horn hidden under a pile of grass. Unlike Joyce, who identifies patients' conditions based on their dreams and her own powers, Charles uses the method of tossing bark into water to read its meaning. He says that the patients are being haunted by ancestral spirits, causing their pain. He instructs them to mix the items he gives them into their bath water and to brush their teeth with the bark. Then he blows the powder from his hand three times every morning and evening for nine consecutive days. Charles claims that his treatments always work. His treatments mostly succeed because he treats the root cause of the symptoms. To be fair to him, if a patient returns, he will treat them for free until they recover. Like Joyce, Charles also gives us herbal remedies. But their aim this time is to boost energy and strength. Another similarity between the two witch doctors is their firm refusal to use their powers to curse or harm others. On our way back, we ask Michael, our interpreter, if he has ever received treatment from a witch doctor. He recounts his negative experiences with such treatments. He had been in an accident which led a doctor at the hospital to put casts on both of his wrists for two months. A neighbor then suggested that he should seek treatment from a witch doctor. When neighbors saw me and some friends, they said, Oh, no, tell you, that thing will not cure. Do you know what? We know of a witch doctor who can actually correct your, your, your arms. You don't need to stay in those things for two months. You go to the other guy, we'll remove them immediately. And then after a few days or a maximum of a week, you'll be okay doing your things. I said, okay. So I found this guy and I explained to him. I said, why do you trust those things? You know, those things are not going to work for you. I have to remove them. We got a laser blade, <laughs> cut everything out of my arms. Now, after that, we got some sticks with some medicine, tried to pull me and smear me some medicine, then got also a glove and then kind of tied those sticks. So my hands were kind of, again, sticked into one direction like this. But it was so painful because uh, I remember I could not sleep. And then he, promised he tells us that he returned to the witch doctor several times as advised, but after three weeks with no improvement, he began to realize that he might have made a bad choice. He then returned to the hospital, but it was too late. Michael shows us his deformed wrist, caused by the witch doctor's treatment, which could take up to six months of corrective surgery to fix. Nowadays, although traditional healing by witch doctors may not always yield definitive or positive results, there are still people who prefer to seek such treatment. This preference may stem from deeply ingrained and long-standing beliefs or the reassurance these traditional practitioners offer to the sick, something that modern medicine often cannot provide. It is this factor that leads many Ugandans to continue seeking treatment from witch doctors.